welcome to the Hunting Illinois podcast. Uh, I'm Jason Buckley, and with me today, we have Curtis Twelman. Hello. Hey, Curtis. All right, so today's podcast is going to be pretty fun. Um, we actually uh, met an interesting person when we were doing one of our archery shoots, and um, it's fun that with this job, we get around the state and we kind of meet people. And uh, this guy had a really fun hobby and was really focused on traditional archery. And uh, Curtis got talking about him and uh, kind of went down this rabbit hole traditional archery with him we're like you know what this is really interesting how we get you on the podcast and talk about it so he was nice enough to sit down with curtis and kind of go over his hobby and kind of what got him into it and different things he's learned along the way so that's pretty neat he caught my eye because i was the scorekeeper at the 3d archery we've been doing these events where we set up a 3d archery course kind of like a, a golf course and then people go through and we score it and there's prizes and super fun you should check them out but anyway uh, Aram caught my eye because he was shooting a longbow and doing really well, but not only that, but with both hands, depending on where the target was set up, he would switch between his right and his left. And, and yeah, I started talking to him and figured out like, wow, this guy's a, a wealth of knowledge. And I just asked him, I was like, Hey, I think this would be some fun stuff to talk about. And, um, and he was all for it. And I think he had a good time. It's obviously a subject he he's super devoted to. So I think he had a good time sharing his knowledge. And he is a super fun guy to chat with. So we, we might even talk with him again uh, at some point on knife making or or something like that. Yeah, no, it's he's super interesting. And it's just goes to show how someone's hobby can really uh, you can go deep on a hobby and it's, it doesn't take a lot either to, to just kind of start digging around that information. And yeah, he also caught our eye because he was shooting, uh, an Asian style recurve bow type, but like a traditional bow, um, instead of your traditional recurve that you see a lot of people shooting nowadays, this was like more of an Asian, it was a different style than you would see anyone else shooting I, that I've ever seen anyway. So, um, interesting, uh, interesting guy. He has a bunch of different bows and you guys t go into that. So, um, so before we get into that, though, we're going to talk a little bit about some uh, some outdoor news and then some updates for the program. And uh, so we're getting into hunting season now. So right now, squirrel season open on August 1st, dove season open September 1st, and that's going strong. And then also uh, the early goose seasons opened up and that goes from the 1st to the 15th. So that way you can get some of those local geese that uh, are always on your HOA lawn and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh Good luck going out there and trying to get some of those guys. Then we also have some of the lotteries have come up and a lot of the August lotteries are out now. So if you applied in August for goose and duck blinds, as well as the upland hunt uh, ability to go out to a public land and hunt upland, all those are out now. So go to IDNR website and check to see if your lottery number got pulled and if you got yourself a site this season. And then uh, there's also the second lottery for duck blinds, which runs September 1st to the 15th. So you can apply for that now, as well as the Bobcat uh, lottery, which runs from September 1st to the 30th. So if you're interested in going out and hunting and trapping Bobcat, uh, you can apply to that as well. And a little birdie told me that somebody may have uh, may have been lucky in the duck lottery. Yeah. Yep. So I didn't get any of the uplands that I applied for, but I did get a duck blind and we'll be going out. And I'm actually going to add that to our list of donated hunts for our hunt camp, which is coming up on October 1st. So this is going to be the large event that we're having up at Crystal Lake area at the quarry. And we're having uh, many different uh, outdoor groups joining us there. And we're going to have raffles that are free to people to put their tickets into and for outdoor experiences for so mentored hunts and hunting opportunities and possibly some gear as well so if you're interested in that come on out but you can find that information on our website and my duck blind i'll have at least one spot available for someone to come out and uh join us out out in the out in the blind so there you go that's pretty awesome and where's that hunt at again yeah that one is going to be at banner marsh which is along the illinois river uh, so it should be a good time of year. Um, it's going to be early right. December. So early December and you get to hunt with us. Like, yeah. What's not to love about that? You know, I'm going to be and utilizing Dan. Dan will yeah. be there and then one winner. And that's just one, one of the hunts. We've got dozens of hunts like that, that people are going to be getting hooked up with at hunt camp. And uh, 
but that one's going to be super fun. So mm -hmm. whoever wins that, we're going to have a, we're going to have a good time, not promising any limits, but we can promise a good time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I definitely need to utilize you guys for all your decoys and, and duck calling experiences for sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And then I think, I mean, Dan's going to be offering up a squirrel. We're going to do a group squirrel hunt. We're going to do, um dan and myself are going to do deer hunts that will take people out for at least a deer hunt and a sit on a public land and then uh and then this waterfowl hunt and then i think dan's going to do an upland hunt as well so we just as our program with what we can do we're going to be donating that and then hopefully the other the other groups have have their donations come through as well so come on out and get a chance to win an opportunity to come out with us and learn firsthand it's impossible for us there's only three of us full time so it's impossible for us to have a mentor program um, but this is the best that we got. So come on out and get an opportunity with us during this hunting season. And then uh, we have a couple other events coming up. So this Saturday, we have a shoot at um, the Middle Fork Forest Preserve, which is a Champaign County park. And you can find that information on our website as well. It's going to be a free free shoot to come out and win a prize that's worth over 100 bucks. So you can come out and do one of these 3D archery shoots similar to where we met RM at. And uh, it's a really fun time. And a lot of people have been really enjoying it. They, they're happy. We're bringing archery to places that don't have archery already, I think is what the main goal is for this, is really just going to these different public land sites, getting the permission to have these different archery shoots and having people come out to a range that might not be there otherwise. So come out, get the practice in. The season's right around the corner. And um, even if you're new at it or a, a expert ar archer, uh, come out. And um, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, welcome, open to everybody. We've yeah. had really good archers come through, and we've had people that haven't hit a single target, and that's yep. fine. And and uh, we actually, we do give prizes to the top male and female archers, but then we also pick one random participant. So regardless of store, score, we just draw out one random card. So it doesn't matter if you, even if you have the lowest score in the whole day, you have a chance of winning and uh, they're um, on X elite membership. So all 50 states, um, the best um, mapping subscription that on X has, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, an awesome prize. And like Jason said, super fun. We all need reasons, like just an excuse to practice. And we set up a little practice range where we've got blocks. You can take a few shots before you go through the course and then get, uh, nine or 10 cracks at uh, 3d targets set up in a hunting simulation and um yeah it's fun and we all need more practice so yeah waiting for it. sign up it's the last one we have posted we it's possible we'll have more but we're getting into our busy we're gonna have to get into the hunting 101s and yeah we just run out of time so yeah this might be the last chance this this season absolutely yeah and um the thing that surprised me a lot curtis is that people hang out i mean it's really they, like they might have like a they, it takes about 15 minutes to go through the course and they'll sit there for another hour and just talking to each other and, and kind of just getting the lay of the land of, of where everybody's at and what they've been up to and it's really cool um to yeah, facilitate that hunters are social creatures you know mm -hmm. everybody wants to talk especially now you got seasons coming up and uh so yeah, it's great. Well, uh, you know, great to be that excuse for for people to talk and uh, and uh, exchange tips. Maybe who knows? Some people might be hunting the same place. They drew tags at the same location. You know, good time to talk and develop a plan right now. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have some webinars coming up, and so those are all free to sign up for. And if you can't make them, um, then you can sign up and then get a recording emailed to you, and you'll have first dibs at watching that recording. Uh, I'm sure they'll end up on YouTube eventually, but it helps us out if you register for them and let us know that you're watching them. So uh, we have a Deer 101 course on September 15th, and that's going to be 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Then uh, Deer 102 on September 20th, and that's going to be 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Then we have the Deer Stand Placement Strategies on September 22nd from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And so, again, if you're working and you can't make those ones in the middle of the day and you're interested in getting that intro info, then uh, just register for them and we'll email you a link to the recording. And if you have any questions at all, please email us or Facebook message us and we'll get back to you in a timely manner. Anything else to add to that, Curtis? Just if you can be there live, um, mm -hmm. we're always open to discussion. So we, we, you know, take questions at any time. So 
live is always best if you uh, want the back and forth. But yeah, we try to get that content where everybody can can uh, digest it. Even if you're working at that time, you can watch it later or mm-hmm. something. It'll it'll be out there. But uh, we hope to see a bunch of you live and get some discussion going because that makes it more fun when we can kind of tailor it to uh, to the people that are there. Yeah. And it's way more fun if people put in the chat and start asking questions. Um, hopefully it doesn't derail us too much, but sometimes that's where the, some of the meat of the information is at. I mean, we do our best. We go through a slideshow and kind of go through the, the gist of, of what it takes to get hunting in Illinois. But some of these questions that people ask, they really take us down a path that we might not cover in the PowerPoint. And uh, it's it leads to a more interesting conversation with everybody there. So uh, don't be scared if you do join to, to ask a few questions as we're moving through it. There's always somebody else that's thinking the same question, you know, so mm-hmm. no, no bad questions at all. Yeah. So, uh, all right, with that, let's get into the main topic of the day, which is going to be the traditional archery. So this one is going to be a lot more visual. Um, so Curtis has some PowerPoint slides here that we're going to go through quickly, and then we're going to get into the discussion that he had with Arm. But uh, even when he's talking to Arm, Arm's ha- holding up different bows and things and, and different things that he's made over the past couple of years here. So uh, if you're listening to this via like iTunes or, or Spotify, um, you might want to check out some of this on the YouTube page. But uh, it's still still informative and still interesting to listen to. All right, Curtis, go ahead. All right. Thanks, Jason. So, uh, yeah, just a few visual aids, like Jason said. So this is a little bit more visual than a lot of our podcasts. We're sorry for uh, the folks of you that we know are out there driving trucks, delivering stuff and listening to us. It's still going to be a good listen, we promise. Uh, But if you do get the chance to watch it, it's a little bit better that way. So we're just going to talk a little bit, a brief intro about what traditional archery is you know now today when people hunt generally you've got your crossbow hunters your vertical bow hunters which includes people who use compound bows which are modern day uh, bows and then traditional archery equipment which is basically just a stick and a string so traditional bows can include long bows and recurves, um, anything that there's no cam, no wheel, no mechanism uh, like that in it whatsoever. So generally traditional archers are shooting a uh, very bare bow, not very much equipment on here at all. Um, and uh, generally no sights, it's instinctive shooting. Uh, there's a few different ways to grip the string, which we'll we'll kind of talk about. Um, but usually it's going to be with your fingers on the string, like this guy here in the picture, with either one on top and two below, or three fingers below the arrow, which which might be a little bit more popular. Uh, when we talk to Aram, we also talk about Uh, like the Mongol archers on horseback and how they would fire with their thumb. Uh, And that's because you could reload your arrow and fire in one motion without having to turn your hand around. And I mean, that's really interesting to think about when you're in a war situation, you got to fire arrows as rapidly as possible. That's a huge benefit to just pull back with your thumb and be used to, to shooting like that. So cool stuff. That's just a teaser of what we're going to talk about with Aram, but here's kind of an example of a whole bunch of different styles of of traditional bows. Um, And yeah, you'll see all made for different things. Some of the most famous, the traditional English longbow, uh, which is generally the, the same height as a person, you know, six foot long. Uh, A lot of these were really heavy bows. Um, famous uh, from Wales and England and uh, for hunting and for warfare. And a lot of us have seen the movies where, you know, some of the lines of archers are throwing up the the arrows, you know, way up in the air and they're screaming down at enemies. And a lot of times those archers are using the traditional English longbow. Uh, You can see up above that, though, the version that the Mongols used, which is a kind of a a form of a recurve where um, 
it's a lot shorter. And so since they were fighting on horseback, they couldn't really ride around with a six foot long bow that utilized those giant three foot levers on each side of your, your hand to produce the, the strength. So the Mongols made a composite bow with like horn, wood, sinew, like animal and fish glue, all this stuff together to make something that could uh, make an incredible amount of power in a much shorter package. So pretty cool and a lot of different variations there some of which are, are pretty famous in, in history for one reason or another. Um, here's just a picture of the English longbow. This guy is shooting two fingers under, one finger over. Uh, here's um, an example of the Mongol bow from horseback, much shorter. And if you look close, you can't really tell. I can't tell if this gentleman is shooting with his fingers on the string or if he's doing it the traditional way with his thumb it kind of looks like his his fingers to me but um, which is obviously much more popular today um, here's a picture a kind of a close-up picture of what it looks like when you're shooting with the thumb release and they would use like a little ring on their thumb that would be made out of horn or something like that to uh, reduce fatigue because otherwise you'd imagine just one finger pulling back a bow all day that might be 60, 70, 80 pounds. Um, that could definitely lead to injuries if you're not a little bit protected. So I'm sure right there she's wearing a, a, thumb, a thumb ring to, to help with that. Um, and yeah, with that, we will get into our discussion with Aram, which, uh, like we introduced him earlier, he's a, a wealth of knowledge when it comes to traditional archery. He's also made his own bows, and that's what we start out talking about. We start out talking about a bow that he made uh, for less than five bucks, he said, with just PVC and uh, some, some plastic and some duct tape and paracord. And uh, it's like a 60 pound bow that if he wanted to, uh, I believe he could hunt with, which is pretty cool. So this right here, I mean, as you can see, is just a three quarter inch pipe. Yeah. And just paracord bow string, just PVC. And actually in the middle of this, there are fiberglass rods. Like, you know how uh, there are highway markers, the yeah. orange highway markers, yellow ones. Oh, yeah. You basically make a you make you make a bundle of those like how uh, you see a car's leaf spring. There's a smaller one here, and there's a longer one on top of it, and a longer one. Yeah. So that kind of gives it an even spread, and I can actually string this bow. Let me show you. Now, did you have to so, glue those fiberglass rods in there? You just uh, with with just uh, tape. You just, just tape. tape them. Okay. Yeah, duct tape, and it fits in, and there you go. Nice. See? It's like a shorter long bow. And actually with PVC pipe bows, if you want to make a higher draw with bow, you don't want to go longer. You want to get shorter. So if I wanted to, uh, if I had a light bow, like let's say 40 pounds and I wanted to get more draw weight out of it, I just cut it up a little bit more and get a shorter bow string. And that would increase the bow poundage. And oh. you don't have to worry about the PVC breaking, especially because you can draw this wow. you get an extreme, you can get an extreme curve on the limbs and it's, it's not going to affect it. I mean, it, it's, you can leave it strong. It's going to get a bend in it, but you don't have, you don't have to worry about this kind of thing. Cause it can, you can drop it. You can leave it outside. It's just only three, four bucks, you know? Sure. So, and it's well, really awesome. fun. To yeah. Somebody who wanted to just kind of start shooting, you could make your own bow for like five bucks. That's cool. Yeah. There's these, uh, there's videos uh, I've seen on YouTube. People are talking about uh, making survival bows. Yeah. And the question, the question of PVC pipe bows comes up or post-apocalyptic bows or that kind of thing. If you don't have a bow, I mean, you got PVC pipe laying around and you can find highway markers pretty much anywhere. Yeah. So you can cut those up if you know how to do it. It takes less than 20 minutes, I think. If you got like, like let's say like you got a hacksaw, that's all you need. Just a hacksaw blade and to make the notches. So for the bow string yep. you sit on. You can do that with a hacksaw too, but I would say just have a rat tail file or some wider saw so you can make the cut and that's all you need. So. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. And then, so you just wrap the whole thing kind of with duct tape and uh, you're good to go. 
Yeah, do, I've actually do you got rest the arrow uh, on your hand, or where do you rest the arrow? Oh yeah, so let me show you the arrow. I rest it right on my hand, so oh, actually this one doesn't even have a knock, but basically this is the idea. So yeah. right up on the finger there, and actually this is the uh, this is the like a primitive style of shooting because bows back in the day, medieval bows, uh, they didn't have arrow rest this is a recent phenomenon basically because it helps with accuracy but uh there's this guy on youtube his name is ryan gill and, and he makes primitive bows and arrows and all stone age stuff so he'll make stone points and he'll make his arrows out of uh river cane and that kind of stuff yeah and he talks about uh actually i learned this from him so how do you line the shot and you don't have a and people ask you know like you don't have a knocking point you don't have a arrow rest you got to be all over the place but he says, you can actually, if the arrow is like this, if it's lower, when it, when it passes, it's going to rub your hand and people often feel that. But if you have it a little bit higher, you know, then you yeah. can basically just adjust by lining the arrow up and it doesn't matter if it's a little bit here, a little bit here. All, all that matters is that it's lined up and you just adjust every single shot. So, yeah. and I mean, the, the, the guy has killed uh, big animals with a bow and arrow is probably killed bison, a deer, all kinds of stuff, hog. Oh. So, and he uses his technique. So, that's pretty that cool. I learned from him. And talking about fingers on the string, so you primarily shoot like three fingers under, like Apache style, correct? Uh, Apache? I don't, I don't know about Apache, but uh, this is like the most common style, the three finger under. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Maybe the Apaches also did this, did it this way. Actually, this is like very common design, uh, a common like style of shooting because even there are tribes in South America uh, and they also shoot just like this. It's just like a natural way. It helps you aim a lot better, more potential for accuracy. But of course, if you're shooting from the, uh, like a thumb release, you have to put the air on the other side and you can get really good with it too. But Have you, have you more... tried shooting with the thumb release? Oh, oh yeah, I have. Yeah. It's just, it just, uh, it takes a, a lot of practice actually. I mean, I yeah. can get good with it. I just like just muscle memory and doing that, but it just hurts my thumb, and that's why I don't do it. I, yeah, I have to get a thumb ring. There's just yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the that's what the Mongols wore, right? They would, uh, they'd have like a little ring that they would wear on their thumb with like a notch on it, right? That would kind of protect their yeah. fingers because some of their bows were pulling pretty heavy poundage. <laughs> long yeah yeah distance oh yeah their bows were really powerful and all these asiatic style bows they like cultures like the turkish uh the sassanids all these people they had uh, thumb rings and they were shooting with the thumb i mean yeah. i've seen on youtube you can actually make one from leather too like how you get leather finger tabs you can make yeah. one for for your thumb too and you just have to kind of get used to uh i think you have to get your thumb used to the, the way of shooting Sure. But it is a fun way of shooting because it's actually a faster way to reload. So if I can show you this again, so let's say I have my bow in my in my hand and then I want to reload. So I pick up an arrow and I don't have to switch to the other side. Otherwise, I'd have to do this whole other movement oh. then get on this side. So for them, it would be much easier. And they had side quiver. So just get it off the side quiver, immediately knock the arrow, and then they would like... Uh, do the thumb release like this yeah so you could do it all in one motion basically yeah just shoot and just keep going on like rapid fire yeah uh have you uh seen the lars anderson videos you know oh. lars An uh, anderson no i i have not oh that that is like the most uh, popular archery video you have to definitely look it up okay. and he is that he, on youtube he, yeah, it's on YouTube. Yeah. I mean, he's made, he's had, he has a YouTube channel, but his uh, first video that he made, it went super viral. There's like uh, many, many uh, millions of views on that video, and he's doing super fast archery. So as soon as he loses an arrow, immediately after that, he's, he's able to knock it super fast. He's not there wow. standing there trying to figure out, oh, I'm going to knock and then all this. And he's shooting from the, uh, from, with the thumb release on the right side of the bow, or wow. on, on the, well, yeah. If you're if you're right-handed, then on the right side of the bow. Yeah. So basically, so, the opposite side of the bow that most people are used to putting the arrow on. Yeah. 
Yeah. And he, he wow. this is uh, actually a historical technique. There were accounts of, uh, 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 like in history, that people could shoot bows and arrows with such speed. And uh, they had people, like modern people, thought that it was all fake. It was just, oh, just exaggerations of the time. But then when he came out, uh, out and did all this, then they were like, yeah, this is actually, like people actually did, did this. And he studied from the sources, from the books, and figured out how to do it. So it's pretty awesome. It's amazing what people can can do with a little bit of practice and time, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Pretty cool. Oh yeah, and nowadays actually the the pioneers in archery. So there's this guy. Uh, his name is Jurg Sprave. Uh, I don't know if you've seen him. His, his channel name is the Slingshot Channel, and he he actually made a magazine for a bow and arrow. Yeah. Like, can you believe it? It's a, it's a magazine. It, it looks like a crossbow that is vertical, but there are... feeding them arrows, huh? Oh, oh, yeah. You just pull it back, release, pull it back, release. And yeah. it's, it's like a magazine. You can just... Even if you don't shoot thumb release, you can have a lot of fun doing that if you can buy the magazine. It's called a Instant Legolas, I think. And some companies actually made uh, carbon replicas of it, of his wow. design, because he actually built it in his workshop just with pieces of wood, plywood, and you know sure and so that mounts to the bow i'm guessing it just mounts to to the bow yeah yeah mm-hmm. i'll have to check that out that's that's pretty pretty cool <laughs> mm-hmm. be a good way to uh to target shoot a lot really quick or lose a bunch of arrows <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know it, we just had a, another 3d shoot like the one you were at up at uh uh chain of lakes we just had one at horseshoe lake and I think we we donated about a dozen arrows into the grass out there, so <laughs> somebody yeah. find a good score come fall time when the when the grass goes dormant. Mm-hmm. I, you know, actually, I, I recently made an arrow with uh, the glow in the dark tape. I think if you get Something that, like and that. then if you ever like lose your arrows, maybe that's gonna help you find them better at night. I, I haven't had that problem, but it just looks really cool with a green arrow that's glowing in the dark, and you shoot it in the For dark. Sure. It's just really fun so. yeah that's that's a great point i know i like on my arrows i put a wrap on them i like white so i put a white wrap on the back and that that helps me find them at dark or helps me also track my arrow when i'm shooting at something like a deer but but yeah the glow mm-hmm. in the dark that takes it even a step further because <laughs> that's gonna gonna really shine up when the lights go down mm-hmm yeah, yeah, you probably yeah. make glow in the dark paint too. Have you ever tried that? Like paint them? Uh, I have. Paint? Yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know about it, but I haven't tried it yet. So maybe in the future I'll try it. Sure. But we'll see. Yeah, but the tape idea seemed like you can take it off if you don't like it. And also oh yeah. Just more versatile, and that makes the arrow a little bit heavier too. So adds a little bit of weight to it. There you go. So, more penetrating force. Mm-hmm. Well, you and started out making your own bows. Where where did you go from there? From there, uh, I mean, uh, the reason why I was making my own bows was because uh, when I looked online and trying to buy bows and arrows, there were actually it's re- it's not common to find bows that are just like ambidextrous uh, like yeah. this. So this bow I can shoot right-handed or left-handed, and I kind of prefer that. So I can do practice on both sides because. When I'm practicing for long hours, then one side gets sore, and my fingers are going to start to hurt, and then I can just switch to the other side, and that way I can just keep continue doing archery, you know. And it's a pro tip right there. I forgot you shot with both hands in that competition. You we got to that one shoot, and you were like, "Ah, let me switch around and shoot this one from the other side." <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a good good skill to have. I'm I'm horrible with my left hand. I don't think I could do anything opposite ways because I don't practice it. But like when you started, did it feel really awkward or kind of are you are you good with both hands all the time? Well, actually, uh, when I started, it was pretty bad uh, on my yeah. left side, and I, I I wanted to do it, but then I kind of was like, you know, it's not fun shooting like this, so I'm just gonna let go. But then. Uh, when I got this 70 pound longbow and I was shooting with the three finger release back then my technique uh, I put a lot of weight most of my weight would go on my ring finger yeah and that's actually not good because you want to have it on the middle finger and then evenly spread throughout the fingers uh, the, the, the top and the lower finger 
So mine was like this one. And uh, I thought that it would help me like get a smoother release. And yeah. this finger would barely even be on the string. So all that weight was, uh, it started to hurt my finger and then I couldn't shoot uh, this way any longer. So that's when I was forced to learn this way. Oh. And that's when I got good. So how long do you think it took you until you felt comfortable shooting with your off hand? Mm, I think it, it took me a month or two yeah of uh, regular practice and that it, then it starts to click then it starts to actually feel right when you pull the air uh, sure. pull the bow back and you you, you knock and it, you kind of click so that's well, it's good to know that there's there's hope even for those of us that feel awkward doing things left-handed you know just a month of practice and maybe we'll be there <laughs> yeah it's just fun because uh, even in hunting situation, I mean, if you're equally good with both sides, let's say, uh, if you got game on, uh, if you're sitting this way, but you have game coming on that way, if you have an ambidextrous bow and you can shoot ambidextrously, you can just kind of shoot this way without having to turn all the way around like this. So it's actually, even historically in warfare, they would train their archers to be both uh, ambidextrous from horseback so they could shoot this way or this way. Because imagine turning all the way if you're a right-handed shooter, if you're shooting like this, yeah. and having to turn like this on a horse, you can't turn your legs, and it's, it's really hard. So it's just easier to know how to do it like this. Yeah, that, that I mean, that makes sense. And I, I mean, usually that's how a lot of us do pick up a new skill like that is out of uh, necessity. So like you said, you got injury, had to start shooting the other way. That could happen to somebody like coming up to hunting season, maybe you're shooting your bow, you're feeling great. And then all of a sudden, uh, yeah, whatever, maybe you injure your thumb or a finger on your right hand and you think your season's mm -hmm. done, but if you have the ability to switch to the other side, then maybe you can still go. Yeah. And especially the important part is because in archery, uh, you don't want to, it's not purely just a strength sport. It's a lot of technique and coordination. So if you're starting to basically fatigue too much, then your technique is going to go bad and you can actually hurt yourself. So when I'm practicing, I'll, I'll do often, like uh, if I'm doing a heavy bow, I'll practice with one side. And then when I start to get sore, I don't want to push it too much because if I, if I push it too much, I'm likely to hurt myself. So then I can switch to the other side when it's fresh and I can keep practicing, you know? And it's just fun. You can shoot longer and it's, it's just uh, really versatile the way you can shoot. Cool. <clears throat> yeah it's a great tip and i you know we always tell people like you got to practice with your archery equipment but you can't practice for too long in one one time chunk because yeah it's mm -hmm. it's a physical thing it's different than pulling a trigger on a gun you could do that all day long but if you want to mm -hmm. target shoot archery you're using your muscles so at some point you get a little shaky and you're no longer probably practicing. You're just, like you said, potentially going to injure yourself from, from working yourself too hard. So yeah, but that's what makes archery fun. You know, you, you can't yeah. practice a ton all at once. It takes a long time to get good. And that's why when you see somebody who's a really skilled archer, uh, you got to take your hats off and just respect that. Cause you know, the amount of time and effort that went into that, nobody's just mm -hmm. born I, I mean i don't know maybe robin hood or something but <laughs> most mm -hmm. people are not just born being a good archer that's hours and hours probably hundreds if not thousands of hours of practice oh yeah definitely i mean uh, when i first started uh i think uh, i wasn't even shoot. i didn't even know anything about archery i didn't know anybody that was shooting a bow and arrow i just kind of wanted to do it you know i was like you know hunting seems cool and hunting with a bow and arrow would be cool so i just got a bow and then started practicing. I mean, obviously right-handed, and I would actually not put the arrow on uh, the right side. Like, you know how if you're shooting three three finger, you have to put it on the left side. I was putting it on the right side, and I would kind of wonder why the arrow kept falling off. Oh. Every time I put it there, and I had to keep my wrist bent like this. But then uh, I started watching videos and started learning and get and get people's advice because I was getting frustrated because I wasn't going anywhere with the bad technique. So. It helps a lot if you don't know anybody and you want to practice. You, there's a lot of resources online. There's a lot of people making great videos, great content, and I mean, people talking about it on this podcast too. So that you know, that's going to help people that are starting off in archery. So for sure, for sure. So what what other bows did you bring to show us here? Um, 
Actually, I, I want to talk more about this uh, this longbow right here. So yeah. this bow actually, uh, I I don't know a lot of people that would own this type of bow. They they, they have longbows, but this is actually fiberglass, fully fiberglass bow. But it, it is take down. So there is a metal pipe here, and the the limbs go in, and no no air rest. So it's totally like kind of primitive style. The reason why I actually got this bow is because fiberglass is like nearly bulletproof and you can leave it strong you can leave it it's not going to be affected by hot or cold or moisture or anything like that so it's a perfect kind of a hunting bow or like even like an apocalypse bow it's, it's got a good good weight to it it's going to definitely kill a deer 70 pound longbow yeah. and not the most not the most comfortable bow because people will say hey it's a lot of hand shock or whatever but i mean it works for me you know i like this bow is i like feeling the heavy weight like when you pull it back and you release you feel all that energy going into the arrow yeah and it's really fun yeah yeah and i mean what more could you want from like a survival or like you said like a post-apocalyptic bow than something that you know mm -hmm. is always going to be functional you know that's a lot of yeah. things we don't think about people like hot cars you know, if you, if you mm -hmm. leave your bow, I don't care if it's a, a, you know, long bow recurve or even a compound bow in a car in the summer, when that car is getting mm -hmm. up to 110, 120 degrees, uh, yeah, things can fail. I've seen laminated bow limbs come apart uh, because mm -hmm. of the heat, you know, melting that glue. So, um, yeah, a bow that's basically, yeah, like, uh, like a, the cockroach of bows, you know, <laughs> just nothing you can do yeah. it almost. Yeah, and th these bows are actually I got from uh, eBay, and I've actually got another one coming up. Uh, it's going to be an 80-pound fiberglass longbow, just like this one, except it's not going to be a takedown bow because this is a takedown. So it's not, it's going to be all one piece of fiberglass, big one piece. I don't even know how they make them. I probably pour them or whatever in China. Yeah, but, but that they're, one doesn't they're have any metal in it. It's all fiberglass, the new one. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's gonna be all fiberglass. You can get there's two versions. You can get a takedown version, or you can get a full uh, one piece uh, bow. This is uh, seventy pounds was the highest you can get on the takedown version, and I feel like I'm getting good with the seventy pounds. From so when I get uh, the eighty pound one, start practicing even heavier weight. Oh. So hopefully I don't hurt myself again. <laughs> Yeah, so you talked about like the the finger injury, um, tendonitis stuff like that. Have you ever had any other injuries from shooting, like pulling a back muscle or something like that? Um, I haven't had like uh, muscle pulled, but I have had like fatigue and soreness and really like shakiness, sure. especially because if I'm working out, if I do like working out triceps, and then after that I try to go and shoot the bow my hand it's going to be hard to keep my hand stable it's just going to be shaking so much and also your shoulder muscle too i get uh, on my right side my rear delt muscle actually feels really sore when i'm holding it left side is solid it's like just an imbalance because my left side is shoulder is stronger so i can hold a lot more weight over here this side i kind of have to like squeeze a lot harder so but but it's nothing nothing like a big injury or anything yeah, it's, I yeah I definitely understand with the just the fatigue because shooting a bow it, it like uses muscles that I feel like you don't use for for many other things. I mean, obviously you're using mm -hmm. your arms, your shoulders, and all that, but it's like your back muscles, like between your shoulder blades. You know, for me, that's the thing that starts to get tired after I shoot. That's what tells me like, okay, it's time to stop because my my I feel like my back gets tired before my arms do. Mm hmm. Yeah. And if people uh, are having this kind of issue, it might also be a technique problem. Sure. So if you're if you're uh, if you're kind of pulling the bow back like this, you know you're not lifting your arm up properly. You have to learn how to use your lat muscles properly. That's where you can get the most power. So you can watch videos on that, and you know people can give you good advice on that too. So. Well, yeah, we're, we do live in an amazing time of YouTube videos. It may, like, I wonder how, I don't even know how people did things 20 years ago. It's, you know, 30, mm -hmm. 40 years ago before that stuff, because it's such a resource now. It's like, gosh, in the yeah. old days, it was a lot tougher to, to learn these things. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I want to talk a little bit about the, the history of the bow and arrow and why, like, hunting with this is kind of significant, like, historically, because this yeah. was the weapon 
this was the, the only range weapon that was actually effective in the day because before bows and arrows, there were spears and there were at -lateral. So first came the spear. And if a hunter wanted to get an animal with a spear, he had to be really, get really close. He had to be within like five or six feet of the animal. And <laughs> within the handle game. length, right? Because you're actually mm -hmm. shoving that in. Yeah. Probably for, first came the, the thrusting spear because they've actually done... Uh, they found evidence that uh, in the Stone Age, uh, the, the the evolution of the spear is that they first had just thrusting spears like Neanderthals. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know about them. Like uh, they were in Europe and in Asia, uh, and then when modern humans started coming out, they had their throwing spears. So they actually started throwing objects, and that's what helped them survive better than the Neanderthals, and they outcompeted them. And then eventually, from that the throwing spear became the, the spear thrower, which is the atlato. So they could go even longer distances and would I mean, kill a game with a lot more uh, power and accuracy. And then from that came, after that came the bow and arrow. So yeah. it's, it's yeah, you evolution. Have you ever tried an atlato? You ever thrown one of those? I, I tried to make one, but yeah. I just didn't, yeah, it didn't, uh, I, I didn't really shoot anything with it though. Because I was doing it in my backyard. I don't have a lot of space, but it wasn't flying straight. So I had to probably put some fletchings on it. So next mm -hmm. time I'll make some with fletching. Actually, this right here, this could be like an atlet or dart. This is an arrow that I made from a spoon. Yeah. This arrow his head is made from a big spoon. Huh. And yeah, just haft it on there on a stick. Not even yeah. straight. And uh, it's got duct tape fletchings. So this is something that is so heavy if you shoot it from a bow and arrow. You know, it's like you need a really heavy bow. Yeah. But I guess with the atlero, you can throw this thing really far and you can actually do things with this. So, yeah. Yeah, and then we got to the to the bow and arrow. And, I, uh, you know, Fred Bear has a famous quote. Uh, it's just very simple, but it says, the history of the bow and arrow is the history of humankind. And, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah, that's it goes along with what you're saying perfectly. Like you know, start with just having spears. You got to actually get close enough to game to stick it in them. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, like you were talking about, they've even found like uh, old mammoth and mastodon uh, bones, and you can see spear tips like stuck in those mm -hmm. bones, which is pretty yeah. cool. And then we started yeah. throwing them, and then we actually put the stick and the string together and started firing them, and obviously we're still doing it now so it's a pretty successful story and there's a lot of yeah. famous bows in history too i know you were talking about uh about like the mongols and how um you know they're basically famous for their warfare on horseback utilizing yeah that style of bow this, right there wow yep yeah. and these bows can actually get really short i mean this one is 52 53 inches i think and uh, they can get short as 40 inches. So some of the Turkish bows, they were even shorter. They were like uh, 40 inches. And that's like really, really short for a bow. If you think about it, and you can get 50 pounds, 60 pound draw on these kind of bows and they get a really extreme draw. So I mean, this one is right. Uh, this one uh, is made from fiberglass, but historically they were made from, they would have a uh, sinew on the, uh, over here on this side of the bow. Basically, on this side, on the inside of the bow, they would have horn, and in the middle, they would have uh, 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 wood or bamboo or basically uh, some sort of wood, and they would uh, put it all together with hide glue or fish glue, and that's how they made their bows, but, and that's how they, the Mongols conquered nearly half the world or <laughs> pretty much the entire known world at the time, you know? Yeah, what do they say? Like, I don't know, it's something like... <laughs> one fifth of the people on the world today are like descendants of, of mongols or something i don't yeah. remember the exact numbers but it's a huge number because they oh they yeah were successful at what they did there's no doubt about that mm -hmm. and actually the mongols their their culture was basically based around horseback and uh, horse riding and archery and they combined those those two things and the way they would hunt would be they would hunt a few times a year so they would do like uh, on the plains and the steppes, there's no places to hide. And if you're trying to uh, go, uh, like uh, if you're trying to chase any animal, they can see you from far away, they can run away. 
but with the Mongols, they would be on horseback and they would kind of surround the, the herd of animals with, with all the Mongols basically cornering them in the center. And then they would harvest all the animals and they would have meat for, uh, for a long, long time and they wouldn't have to hunt again. And that's the same technique that they would use on their, in their warfare kind of uh, uh, their, uh, in, in war. So they would actually, uh, when, when people would be fighting on, on foot, they couldn't go as far as the, as the horse riding Mongols and they had the hardy horses. They, they had the mobility and they could shoot and they could run away and they could come back and then shoot and come or run away and they can corner them. And they used those same techniques that they used for hunting in, in their warfare. And it turned out to be pretty, pretty successful. And uh, a lot of people that back then, they didn't have any defenses against that kind of technique because they hadn't faced it. So, yeah. Well, yeah, no doubt it was uh it was super effective. And I mean, you could see riding on horseback that like a big traditional English longbow that's like six foot long, that would get mm -hmm. in the way. So, you know, they it was like out of necessity, you got to have a shorter bow, but they still wanted it to be, you know, strong enough to, I mean, I've read stories about how some of the people said like you couldn't get far enough away to be out of the Mongols range because, you know, reportedly, they could fire those arrows uh, 400 yards, you know, maybe not accurately, but pointing up in the mm -hmm. air. And, and didn't they also use the, uh, like the whistling arrows? So they made like a mm -hmm. sound that would like scare the enemies. Oh, could you imagine being yeah. an enemy and just hearing all these whistles and knowing that all these arrows are coming your way? Holy cow. <laughs> oh, no, man. There would be, they basically, they destroyed the uh, al uh, Farism Empire. Uh, back in I think in in the Middle East yeah. and that, that actually happened when Genghis Khan he actually sent some convoys there and uh, 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 messengers basically I think for trade but they, they, the the Khwarizms they thought they were spies and they had them killed and then one of them uh, ran away and when he got back and told Genghis Khan the news he came and invaded the whole place and they the, the people he invaded they were like uh, their civilization was at the height of this, its power. And they they thought, hey, what are these just horse riding barbarians? And we, we got the best car, we got all this. But yeah. they, they had no match against the Mongols. They came in and wiped the whole city down. Wow. That crazy, crazy how stories like that, they live on. You know, like you were here, mm -hmm. we are sitting here in 2022 telling this story. And <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. So. Yeah, obviously the bow has been super important for human history, not just for hunting, but also in warfare and just in, well, basically in our evolution and helping us get to where we are right now. So what's yeah. to love? Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, the, the, in, the, in the tribes of the Americans, uh, like the Native Americans, they are the Comanches who were the most powerful tribe uh, in North America. And they actually, they, they, they stopped the, the Spanish expansion and even like uh, settlers coming into their land, they were the, the, the one of the few tribes that were actually able to reverse that and actually start conquering lands of the settlers and the Spanish. And they, they, they kind of had the, whole, the entire area of Texas, the, uh, the Great Plains, the Southern Plains. And they, they were like the masters of the plains. And yeah. they, they were also, when they, when they got uh, horses from the Spanish, they perfected the use of the horse and they could they could shoot, they, they would actually use the horse as a shield. So they could shoot from any kind of position. They would kind of hide behind the horse and they could like quickly come up and then take a shot oh, like yeah. that. Yeah, and that's, that's of course been made famous by a couple movies. I can't remember where, but I know I've seen that in movies where you'll see that style of, of fighting where it, it almost looks like just a horse is running at you and then boom, then the, then somebody pops up with a bow that you didn't even know was there because they were hiding behind the horse the whole time. Oh yeah. And actually back in the day when uh, they had those, uh, the guns they had were very primitive at the time and you would have to like kind of reload them yeah. with single shot guns. They couldn't compete with the bows and arrows at the time because those, they could shoot a lot faster and they could actually, it is uh, said that uh, a Comanche warrior could lose ten arrows before the first one hit the ground. So if you, if wow. yeah, you might be you might be far away from you might be sixty yards away, and you might see the uh, one arrow coming, but then you also also had to watch for the other nine arrows that were on its <laughs> way. So you had to, you were yeah. really you know in a tough spot. 
nine more following it holy cow but yeah that makes sense so you imagine back there in that warfare if you saw like a spaniard fire off his musket you know you see a big plume of smoke now you know that person's probably unarmed for a couple minutes so Mm -hmm. that's a good time to strike Mm -hmm. and that's why they 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 invented the six shot six shot revolver basically that 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 was made to compete with the the bows and arrow and the shooting style of the comanches because they were really fast shooting Uh, and then the revolver came around and the cowboys and like the texas rangers would fight them also on horseback and they would take the comanches techniques of raiding and all that kind of stuff and they would implement in their own style and they made themselves kind of uh compete against the comanches sure yeah it's just interesting how all that history just ties together and i mean it still impacts stuff that we use today that we we never think about but that's cool Mm -hmm. so i you i know you like shooting tons of bows but what do you have a favorite like what's your favorite as far as just a fun bow to go out and shoot Mm, that's gonna be a hard question man i mean Uh, for me for different reasons i like the other different bows I like the PVC pipe bows because I can, I can customize them. I can make higher or lower draw weight, and I can make them. Yeah. Basically, uh, it's like a survival bow. I know how to make it, and I can actually go out and hunt with it. Small game, you know. I yeah. like the, the the short reeker bow. Uh, this one, the horse bow. Mm-hmm. This one actually, I like this. It's not too heavy for me, so 70 pounds can get tiring if you're shooting some time. But this one, I can shoot comfortably. I can shoot it for a long time. And probably for hunting, this would be better because it's it's shorter. You can maneuver through this this in the woods, and it's really fast and efficient. The longbow I like because uh, obviously the more power it it produces, so seventy pound longbow. But I think out, out of all of these, I would say my favorite is the longbow. Yeah. For now, right now, it, it it changes, but right now my favorite is the longbow because sometimes just the bow, the, the bow just clicks with you and you're like you know wow this just feels amazing when you release the arrow hits the target yeah that i've, I've been having that with the longbow right now so mm. well that's uh i know uh i don't know if you've heard of byron ferguson the longbow shooter but that's that's one oh, of the yeah. things that he always says i went and watched him do an exhibition shoot up in madison and and uh yeah he he when he get the longbow in his hands he said it just felt right you know, he says mm-hmm. recurves are pretty, but longbow is what fits me. So that's that's what I shoot. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, he's he's another awesome guy to watch. I remember seeing him yeah. shooting, like aspirin out of the air with his longbow, and wow, mm-hmm. he's he's super cool and funny too. If you ever get a chance to to watch him shoot, not only is he a, an amazing archer, but he'll have you laughing the whole time too because he's. He's basically a comedian that's uh, an expert archer. So, <laughs> pretty, yeah, I've seen his shows. Uh, I, I've seen his shows on online on YouTube, and I've yeah. seen some of his videos where he's done like uh, his arrows and the way he's uh, able to time and hit an aspirin tablet like in super slow motion. They show, and he's able to time even the the wobbling of the arrow yeah. so good that it it's hits amazing. The, the aspirin tablet. It's amazing. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, his book it like it's called uh, "Be the Arrow," and just yeah, it's basically he's practiced so much that he the the bow is an extension of himself. You know, he fires arrows like I might throw a ball. You know, I mm-hmm. I grab a ball. I don't even think about it. If I want to hit a tree, I just throw it and hit the tree because I've been doing it my whole life. He's that way with a long yeah. bow, and it's it's just amazing. And there's others like that too, but uh, but yeah, he's he's fun to watch. Oh yeah, yeah. He, he, I've seen him when they throw targets up in the air, and then he's shooting yeah. them. It's just, it's just really fun to watch him do that kind of stuff. And eventually, you know, I want to be able to do, be like him. You know, if, imagine if you could have that kind of accuracy. You know, yeah. you'd be the ultimate hunter. So yeah, you could go out dove hunting with your bow. Hey, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. if you can't find shotgun shells as long as you got your arrows lying around. There you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or you can make them. So yeah, and right make here. them. And I'm glad you the, made that point. Is that made out of a a utensil, or what'd you make that one out of? Oh, this is made from a saw blade, like a saw circular blade. saw blade. Yeah. 
uh, I don't use the modern ones. I use the older ones. Uh, I get them from scrap places. You know, people throw them out. But this is basically the, the most common design that I have. I do have some other designs. So like this one right here. I'm not yeah. sure if this would be legal, but it, it does look like kind of like a medieval style and it has barbs. Sure. And yeah, there's this one right here, a little bit smaller design. Yeah. So they actually, when uh, when I have them to the arrow, they're like with super glue, they're super strong and I shoot them in dirt, shoot them through plywood and all that kind of stuff. The uh, arrows will hold up. You so, just use super freaking, glue? Uh, I use super glue and I use uh, uh, twine okay. or oh, okay. some sort of like n nylon rope to wrap it and give it extra strength. And then I put super glue on top of that and let it dry. So it becomes like a, like a strong, like a plastic coating on there. So actually I could, I could bring some of my, or let me see if I have it over here. Okay. Yeah. The, the only one I have over here is the one that was an experiment. Mm -hmm. I mean, this one. Yeah, this one was a kind of like a bird point. I didn't yeah. know what I was going to make, but I've seen these like in med medieval times. They used to have these kind of arrow points, and they they actually uh, the reason be behind this is because if you're shooting birds in the water, or it, the arrow is not going to go through the reeds, it's going to stop, and you're going to be able to find your arrow again. Retrieve so, it. Yeah, I I used to do a lot of that was one of my primary ways to go frog hunting. Is I had a a little bear kodiak that was only about 35 pound draw weight and uh so it was a lighter weight little small bow and that was a blast me and my brother and dad we would walk up and down the levees and, and shoot frogs with that thing and good way to get a limit of tasty frogs but also a lot of fun too and that point you were just that's what i was thinking i was like man that looks like a good frog point right there <laughs> yeah it gives, like it gives you too. more surface yeah uh, uh I wouldn't use it for fish because it, it would probably just slide out. So oh, this is probably yeah. meant to not go in deep. So if you ever shoot this in the brush or through like a bush, sure. it's going to stop. It's not going to go all the way through because it's not a pointed design. Otherwise, if you had, let's say, this one and you shot this in the in the thick brush, you probably never find the arrow again. Yeah, you know? so it'll just keep going. So for like rabbits or something that you're seeing in a, usually in the heavy brush, that would be a good good thing to get i know they they also you can buy they're called like judo points but mm -hmm. um, you know commercially available points that are similar to that that basically just have little arms that stick out to kind of catch the brush and and help mm -hmm. out because yeah small game most people when they think of archery they're just thinking deer but there's a ton of small yeah. game opportunities with archery as well yeah also we can also talk about knives I don't know if I told you about this. I'm really into knives and like hunting knives and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I actually make them myself too. This is a, uh, here's an example of a knife that I've made. This is made oh. from a, a leaf spring. So I actually find uh, scrap metal. Yeah. Uh, could be a bed frame, anything that has high carbon steel and I can make something useful out of it. So that this is my experience that got me into making these arrowheads too. So these awesome. are no, no problem for me to make and I already making knives like this. Wow. We can talk about what, what makes a good survival knife or a hunting knife and that kind of stuff, too, if you want. Oh, yeah. No, that, that'd that be great because uh, that's mm -hmm. definitely something that I feel like a lot of people are interested in, but maybe a lot of people haven't done is actually mm -hmm. make, make their own knife. So that would be pretty cool. Yeah. So, like, uh, do you have a favorite style of knife to make or you just kind of like the process of building and so whatever it is? Actually, I like choppers, like uh, big, heavy knives for chopping yeah. wood. I like those a lot, but I also like smaller knives. You can use them every day and you can like kind of, you know, you're cutting paper or whatever. You need a smaller knife. I mean, this knife right here, this is a very thick steel. If yeah, you see. basically a cleaver. Yeah, and the design of it makes it really forward heavy. And it's basically like a kukri, but it's a short kukri. So... Yeah really good for chopping and i use this all the time for chopping wood or firewood or whatever i've got i've made some uh longer knives too like some sword types some fighting uh, fighting knife uh, types there's one i'm gonna make is uh this was not complete but this is a from a file this was yeah. a 12 inch 14 inch file and this is gonna be like a buoy knife with the tip up here oh yeah nice 
So are you doing yeah. most of the work just with a grinder then? You cut out the basic shape and then just grind it down? Most, yeah, most of the work is done with an angle grinder. Yep. Uh, some, some of it I can do with a bench grinder and then the bevels, the, the edges I make with the, uh, it's a belt, belt grinder, it's called. And those can be expensive and they're not a beginner tool. Before, yeah. before that, I would just use hand file. So like all this, uh, edges uh, on this knife specifically, they were made by the belt sander, but you could, you could just spend hours and hours filing away and you can get the same result. And I've actually done that with knives that I've made before when I didn't have the power tools, yeah. I just use fi hand files and just file away, file away, file away. Oh. So, that's cool. I, uh, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think it's fun to do stuff like that because it's, I like mm -hmm. working with my hands and as, anytime you make something that like is useful, I mean, that mm -hmm. object just, just means so much more to you than if you just went out and bought it, you know? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, no, that would be awesome. Maybe we can even do like a little video on knife making or something. I think that would be pretty cool. Oh yeah, definitely. That would be really fun. Because, sure. uh, everybody's got a file laying around somewhere i mean they're not using it it's it's already dull it's rusty and it's probably going to get thrown out so if you have, if you got some power tools like an angle grinder that's pretty much all you need and you're going to need some files some sharpening stones and that's about it and you can make a decent knife i actually made a shorter one and a, a longer one of these two i'd have to go and find it i just don't have it on me right now but it's really cool design yeah. And they're actually already hard files. Uh, they're already heat treated, so you don't have to worry about heat treating the knife. So for a beginner, this is really nice because uh, something else like this, you would have to heat treat this because I had to put it in the fire, kind of heat it up, and then flatten the steel out because the leaf springs are like bent like this. They're like a, a U shape kind of. Yeah. You have to kind of flatten them out and then cut it out. Oh. So this would have been heat treated but files don't need any heat treatment they make a solid edge and it, it lasts a very long time yeah so, given given something old new life gotta love it the yeah. best way to recycle wow well, that was awesome just uh i know from me and from all of us at illinois learn to hunt big thanks to arm for taking time out of his day and talking to us on the podcast uh that was super interesting and yeah super fun we'll, we'll definitely have to try to talk to him some other time maybe about making knives or something else cool like that no for sure uh it's so cool to meet people with hobbies it's just one of my favorite conversation topics if i ever bump into someone and, and anyone who's really into something and just pick their brain about it and uh kind of get that that energy they got about it you know, okay try to try to absorb some of that because it's always a fun fun conversation to have for sure. And that's a good uh, like uh, uh, reason, I guess, to bring up if any of you out there have interesting hobbies that are related to hunting uh, like Aram, if you want to talk to us, send us an email, you know, contact us and we can definitely set that up because uh, that's kind of what this podcast is all about. We want to bring just stuff that's informative and fun for hunters to know about and uh yeah, I know for me, that was super fun and informative to, to find out some of that stuff about the, the way some of the equipment that's still being shot today was used in the past. And, and mm -hmm. even in meaningful ways that we were taught about in history class, that's pretty cool. And that was awesome. Yeah. If you guys have any hobbies, let us know. That'd be really cool to meet some of you and, and talk to you about it. It's always a good time. But um, with that, I think we're going to get into some critter trivia. So our last question from our last podcast was asking what the legal draw length and weight of a bow can be in Illinois to go hunt deer with. The answer to that might be surprising. It's not that heavy. It's only 30 pounds with a 28 inch draw. So that's something that people who may be hesitant to go out and maybe shoot a long bow or a vertical bow, I should say, um, because they don't know if they can pull back the poundage. Uh, it's only 30 pounds. And with some modern compound bows, you might find that it's not as far as you might think. So definitely something to look into if that's uh, an avenue you want to go down. So the question for this episode is going to be how long have bows been used by humans? So historians say it's either been what? So what do you think? It's a, let's go with A. 2,000 years, B, 6,000 years, C, 20,000 years, or D, 50,000 years. 
So how long have humans been using bows? What do you think, Curtis? Oh, that's a good one. I, I'll uh, I'll have to give you my guess off air. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but yeah, All it's right. a good one. Just to think about how long people have been doing some of the same stuff that that we go out and do in our backyard for fun. It's it's good. It ties us to the past. I no, for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, thanks again to Arm, and thanks Curtis for for taking time out to go talk to Arm, and uh, we appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody, and thanks, Aram.